Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Outliers YouTube channel uh, and our show, Get to Know. I'm your host, D.P. Lyle, and I'm here with my partner in crime, Kathleen Antrim. And today we are joined by a guest that I'm so excited about. We've got T. Jefferson Parker. He is a best-selling novelist of, I believe, 27 books now. <laughs> um, he has won multiple awards. He's been called a powerhouse writer. Welcome, Jeff Parker. <laughs> Well, nice to be here, Kathleen. Thank you. Uh, it's great to have you here. So I know we haven't caught up for in a while. And, um, you know, in Get to Know, we ask a few different questions. So I want to ask you, do you think your childhood had anything to do with you becoming a writer? I mean, were you one of those kids who had imaginary friends, played alone a lot, <laughs> etc.? Were you a reader? Do tell. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can... Yeah, my childhood formed me as a writer. I mean, I can, I can, I can prove it. I mean, one of my earliest uh, um, memories, uh, age, I don't know, three, four, probably four, uh, sitting on uh, next to mom in our, our our little Torrance living room on a couch, and and mom reading me animal stories, you know. And <laughs> I had I had my favorites. I was passionate about about Vulcan the Condor and Perry the Squirrel and, and of course, Bambi and, and my all-time favorite, and I, I made her read it over and over again, uh, was uh, Shag, Last of the Plains Buffaloes, which you can still get. It's an illustrated book about <laughs> Shag, Last of the Plains Buffalo. Terrific book. Bring tears to your eyes. And uh, so anyway, earliest memory is that. And then uh, uh, mom used to read to me a lot. And before I could even remember, in fact, I was getting literary help from mom in the in the sense that I was in the in, in the crib, uh, I was kind of inconsolable and not happy and and you know just like to whine and you know unhappy little baby a lot and so mom would sit with me and and she would uh, uh, through my you know my unhappiness she would uh, um, she would try to read to herself she was a great reader and she always had a novel and and uh, and and one day she she just couldn't put up with my caterwauling anymore, so she decided to read over me, and she started reading out loud, and uh, you know to 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 me, if you will, and um, my I instantly stopped, and my eyes focused finally, and I listened to mom read me the story, not understanding one word of what she was saying because I was at one. Wow. You know? <laughs> yeah, and it worked. And, and whenever I you know started having a conniption, mom would mom would uh, you know pull out the book that she was used to and. Uh, and read it to me. You know, I have it on good authority from mom that my favorite book at the time when I, I won was uh, the hot bestseller Marjorie Morningstar. I don't know if you remember that book. You're probably yes. I young. don't. <laughs> the, the, I remember it. Nurse having I... adventures, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, yeah, childhood big for sure. I, I always loved being, you know, read to at school. You know, the the noontime elementary program way back then. The teacher would read half an hour after your lunch, kind of thing, and get settling back down after lunch. So uh, yeah, yeah. And then on into UCI and, you know, studying English. So yeah, childhood was a huge, huge for formulative thing, even though I didn't give, you know, any, any real thought to being a writer until high school. You know, that was what I was going to ask you is when do you think you actually decided that you were going to be a writer or, or you know, or you said you gave some thought to it when you were in yeah, high school? Yeah, well, I, I, I can tell you that one too, specifically. It was, it was sophomore year of high school. Um, Tustin High School in, in Tustin, California, mm -hmm. public high school, and my uh, my uh, mythology and folklore class taught by the lovely uh, uh, the lovely teacher there, uh, Ms. Brown, and uh, um, she uh, loved mythology and folklore, and she taught it to us just as hard as she could, and we were just a crummy bunch of average kids, and and we just gave her trouble because she was sensitive and young and all that stuff, and one day she had this stricken look on her face, a rainy day, and she said, you know, I I, I think this class is, is basically incapable of learning, so I'm not going to try to teach you any mythology and folklore today at all. I, 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 bought a, I, I bought a box of paperbacks, my old paperbacks from the garage, and I want you to come up and form a single file line and take one, close your eyes and take one, and take it silently back to your desk and read it for 45 minutes, or I'll send you to Mr. Andrews. He was the guy with the, with, you know, the assistant <laughs> principal with the, the paddle with the holes in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so when it was my turn, I stepped up and closed my eyes and reached into the box and pulled out a well-used copy of a book called called Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. 
Yeah. And I didn't know if Joseph Heller or Catch-22. I mean, I was so naive. I looked look through it, see if there's any pictures, you know. It's like that, that was <laughs> my literary level at that point. And, uh, but I took it back to my desk and I read it. And uh, I, I'm a slow reader, but I, I read it all for 45 minutes. And, and, and then I read it complete for two weeks, read every word of it. And from the very beginning of that book, I was just captured. I, I started laughing and I started thinking, wow, this is this is subversive. This is not like like the, the like my teachers telling me to believe and what the what 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 the, the vicar says at the Lutheran church and what my parents are bringing me up. This is this is kind of dangerous. This is different. You know, this is really funny. And uh, I remember telling myself one day when I was done with that book, I'd walk in the hallways at, at Tustin High or thinking to myself that, you know, if I could ever learn to write and and and, and give a reader a, a, a fraction of the pleasure that I got from Catch-22, I would I would consider myself a successful person. And I think I think at that time I I, I kind of quietly made a deal with myself that I would try to someday um, I would try to someday bring a reader that kind of pleasure. And it took me many many years to to do to 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 commit to that and to do that. But um, that was my that was my start. That was my start was reading that book. Wow. Well, you got your English degree, you know, at uh, University of California, Irvine, UCI here, which uh, has a tremendous literary tradition. There's no yeah, question about that. They really they do. do. They um, do. But then you ended up writing for a, a little newspaper uh, around here. How, <laughs> how did that how did that help you later, a couple of years later, when you decided you were going to write uh, your first book? You know, working as a newspaper reporter, I think was, for me anyway, was the best post-college education I could have had. Um, and, and, and I think what it, it, it taught me two things to, as a writer. One is just the simple kind of uh, uh, mentality of, of making a deadline and it, it right. you write and organize the inverted pyramid of the who, what, when, where, how, you know, how you build a news story is, is essentially how you build a novel, uh, not exactly, but it's, it's close. And um, even more importantly than that though, the, um, um, the, the, the young man's look or young woman's look at the age of say 21 or 22 and you're a newspaper reporter and you're, and you're stepping out into the world and you're seeing how the world really works. You know, I covered city hall, I covered cops, I co covered the school board, I covered the art museum, I covered everything but sports and business because we had sports writers and business writers, but I covered a ton and I learned a lot about the way the world works. And, and, and especially I saw a lot about the way that the, 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 the outside world um, attempts to use journalists and journalism for their own ends you know they're always mm -hmm. promoting themselves and they hey parker you got to read it write the story about my you know my great new you know this great new yacht club that i'm going to form and everything and everybody's trying to you know trying to get something out of you and and and, and so you learn kind of quick how the world goes and and, and i like that and it exposes you to so much stuff i mean i covered I, I did everything from you know ride along with the cops and the helicopters with the cops to to interview um um these 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 poor young women uh, rescued from from trafficking sexual trafficking this was way back yeah. when but it was going on and and so you 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 just learn a ton and you're exposed to a ton so when it comes you know time for me to, to try to think up a a book or or uh, get to a part in a book where I'm I'm not really sure what to do I I I have a lot of uh, just kind of snippets and fo photographs, if you will, mental snapshots that you make, and and, and it's a little catalog of, of experiences that you can build on when you when you write something when you write fiction. So you wow. sat down and wrote uh, Laguna Heat, and lo and behold, it it was critically acclaimed. It was successful. Everybody said, "Who is this new writer?" Uh, and Hollywood came calling. What was that? How did, when they first contacted you, what, what were you thinking? It's like, whoa, dude. <laughs> well, you'll laugh. I'll tell you what I was thinking. This is how this is how young I was. I was thinking, whoa, you know, this this is this is how it happens. This is supposed. This is how it happens. You know, every book I'm going to get a movie made, and it's going to be better, and the reviews are going to be good. And and uh, you know, it took me a while to find out that it's not how it goes. And I was profoundly lucky and and fortunate to to, to do that. And uh, it, it, but it was it was it was nonetheless exciting, you know. There it, it was a really cool it was a really cool um, a moment when I when I viewed the the opening scene of Laguna Heat on HBO. It was an HBO movie for TV, and it was uh, the the star playing uh, Harry Hamlin, the star playing my detective, and uh, he's he's driving uh, onto Laguna Canyon Road from the 405. Um, 
uh, in, in a red Mustang, which is from the book. Uh, uh, Tom Shepard drives a red Mustang in the book, and he zooms all around Laguna trying to solve these crimes. And, and just to see this, <laughs> this red car from my book on Laguna Canyon Road, which I'd driven a billion times and drove yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, it was it, just so, so exciting, so exciting. I loved it. I bet, I bet. Yeah, that had to be unbelievable. I want to back up just a quick step here. I want to know, when did you decide to start writing, to actually start writing your first book? And, you know, when was that? Where were you at in your life? Were you still, <clears throat> excuse me, a reporter? Yeah, I was. It was, it was, it was pre-reporter, Kathleen. It was, it was just after college. Um, I was living in Irvine with my dad and, um, and, um, and, uh, I decided to I decided to write it write a novel. I've been reading a lot of novels and I thought it was time to do it, you know. So I just put the piece of paper in the in the in the typewriter and 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 cobbled together this story about a young surfer uh growing up in Newport Beach whose whose father um leaves the family with the, his secretary and 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 the, the half the family fortune and the business and and just disappears. And it's up to this young surfer guy to to track down his dad and find out why he did what he did and what happened. It was a classic sort of Bildungsroman, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's got almost a coming of age story. The guy's young. Anyway, so I wrote it and I, I it, it, and it, I wrote it. It was two, 250 brief little pages, uh, double space. It was called The Bottom Line. And, <laughs> and I sent it out to a, to an editor at a publishing house that I knew. I'd met at a party of all things, a really young guy, as young as I was. I was like, I don't know, 25 this time, say, 24 maybe. And uh, took me, I don't know, a year to write it. And uh, and I sent it to him and he, and, and he called me a couple of weeks later. He said, Parker, I, I didn't know you were gonna be a writer. I said, well, yeah, I'm trying. He goes, well, look, I'll tell you, um, nobody in New York will publish this book because nobody in the United States cares about a young surfer growing up in Newport Beach looking for his father. But you do have a little bit of talent and you obviously have some, some, some stubborn stick to because you finished the book, you know, most people don't, he says. Uh, so anyway, try again. What you should do is you got to write something more commercial. You got to go to the New York Times bestseller list and read the capsule plots down one through 20, whatever it was then. And, um, Write something like that. <laughs> I said, okay. I'll oh, okay. <laughs> no problem. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, and and uh, and so uh, uh, I, I did. I read the plots, and I don't know. I, I noticed that some of them were mysteries. I think there was a John D. McDonald mystery on, on the list, maybe that week that I was looking, and um, and I knew McDonald because I I I I had come to like mysteries. You know, after my highbrow UCI Shakespeare and Aristotle and critical theory and all that <laughs> kind of stuff, I I, I relapsed into into um, mystery fiction. You know, Chandler and and. Uh, um, you know, um, all, all, all the greats, the big ones, you know, I, I read them all, not thoroughly, but, you know, most of them. And uh, I thought, okay, I'll write a mystery. So, um, you know, once I decided to write a mystery, I just had to ask myself, you know, how, how are you going to, what kind of a story do you want to put together and how are you going to do it? And, 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 and I've always been, um, I had always been strongly drawn to father-son stories and brother-brother stories, yeah, family stories, mm -hmm. father-son, brother-brother. And, and, uh, so I, I had I had you know Cain and Abel running through my head and I had you know the Old Testament stuff and and uh, um, I had just moved from from uh, from, Tus from from Newport actually to to Laguna Beach uh, at, at which I had not really spent a lot of t t time when I was when I was a kid younger and I was I was under the thrall and the charm of Laguna Beach it's such a beautiful place and the, oh, the yeah. long history of art and and the, the liberal people and the you know the hippies and the drugs and the the, the music and the whole scene. I mean, you guys know Laguna. And so yeah. I was in love with Laguna. So I, I knew that I had to set the book in Laguna. I just had to, you know, and uh, and, and, and I cobbled together a, a father and son murder mystery. And, and uh, um, yeah, just tried to just try to make it work. I, it, it took me five years to write that book. And I wrote it five times. And I threw wow. away about a 500 page manuscript too. It was bigger than the first one. And I, I threw that manuscript away once a year for, for five years. And I sat down to write the year six was going to be draft number six. And mm -hmm. I made a deal with myself that if I, if, if I couldn't, couldn't get out, the trouble with my earlier drafts was that I was trying to mimic my heroes. I was trying to be Chandler. I was trying to be Hemingway. Sure. 
I was trying to be Gabriel Garcia Marcus. I was trying to be Tom McGuane. I was trying to be Jim Harrison. I was trying to be everybody. Each each draft, you know, kind of was was like a hero worship, you know. And I sat down for draft six. It's five years later. I said, God, Parker, you're no, just don't. You know, if you can't write a book here that sounds like you, that makes that it's your voice, mm -hmm. and then this can be your last one, and you can do something else for a, whatever. I was working as a reporter then, so. You know, I can I can make it I can do something else. And so I sat down and I thought long and long and long and long and hard about that first sentence because I didn't want it to sound like my heroes. I just just couldn't do it. I finally cobbled together a sentence that sounded good and it was promising and it was uh, kind of alluring. And it, 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 it kind of set the table nicely for a first sentence. And so I I thought that's a good first sentence. I'm going to open it with that and I'm going to make every sentence in the book follow that somehow. I'm going to clone I'm going to uh, metastasize every sentence after that one, <laughs> from that one, you know, and yeah. in the end, it's going to be my book. It's going to be my voice. It's going to be my voice and not these other other people. And it may not be any good, but it will be mine. And so I made myself another deal then. And I spent another year and I wrote it. And when I got it done, I thought, well, OK, I'm going to send, it's ready to send out. No, I'm going to I'm going to send this to an agent and, and um, see See what happens. It was really funny. She was a, a practical gal, good agent. Uh, Jane Jordan Brown out of Chicago, uh, mm -hmm. introduced to me by a writer friend of mine named Don Stanwood. Uh, anyway, uh, Jane read the manuscript and she called me a couple of weeks later and she goes, <laughs> you'll love this. She goes, you writers will love this. Uh, she goes, well, um, Jeff, this is Jane in Chicago and I read the manuscript. And my first question is, is this book as good as it's going to get? <laughs> and, I, and I was taken aback and I thought and I th then I thought about it for just a second and I said yeah yeah you know what because I wrote it five, six times and this is as good as it's going to get and I can't do it any better and she goes okay um, I'll represent you uh, for 20% of everything that you might make um, uh, I will uh, I will uh, get your manuscript out there immediately to the five publishers I have in mind and um um, you will get uh, good news by phone and bad news by mail. <laughs> I said, okay, <laughs> that's Jane, Midwest Jane, you know, totally practical gal. I love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, for a month, month later, I got a letter from Simon and Schuster said, dear Mr. Parker, love the manuscript, can't publish it, great characters, lousy plot. <laughs> a week after that, I get one from Random House, dear Mr. Parker, loved your book, can't publish it, uh, mediocre characters, terrific plotting, you know, and the opposite, <laughs> you know, next one was Crown. Dear Mr. Parker, love the manuscript, you know, can't publish it. Um, you know, for a mystery, uh, this was so simple. We had it figured out on page eight. <laughs> thought, wow, that's too bad. And then a week later, I get another one, another major publisher. And they say, dear Mr. Parker, love the manuscript, can't publish it. This is by far the most complicated mystery we've ever read. And we still <laughs> don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's your here's your 30 year old so know, typical writer right right uh, well you guys have been up against that you know how how editors and publishers contradict themselves by all the time yeah it's, yeah. It's, yeah it's uh so it happens to all of us and and, and, and it left me kind of bewildered and uh you know next week uh um, I got a call from Jane. She said, you know, St. Martin's loves your book. The ed editor, Jared Keeling, stayed up all night reading it, and he's going to he's gonna call you at noon to make an offer. <laughs> so there it was. Yay! Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was, it wow. Was, it was long haul, though. I mean, six, five, six years is six years. I was getting getting discouraged, but then, you know, I didn't have anything better to do. I was working as a newspaper reporter and, and, and uh, just about to leave that and go into a uh, technical mm -hmm. writing and stuff. And, and I had my bases covered and I was purposefully single and unencumbered and I had no no debt or obligations or kids to take care of or anything. So, you know, it was a good it was a good six years. Wow. Now, did you stay with St. Martin's through? Um, well, I mean, are you still with them today? No, no. I, I just jumped all around. I got to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote four books with them and okay. four with the next and several more. And yeah, right now I'm with a uh, um, the same umbrella company that is over St. Martin's Macmillan. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Forge, my publisher is a small kind of an, it's an imprint, I guess you'd say of Macmillan. They've been around. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Specialized in science fiction mm -hmm. and stuff. So I'm in a good spot. So it came full circle in, in, in that sense. 
Yeah, my, my, my first book was with St. Martin's too. In fact, I got a check from Mac Billen uh, sitting on my desk right here today. Cool. I love those people. <laughs> you know? yeah. But you know, you, you wrote a bunch of books and then, you know, uh, I think what people don't know, and I have to admit that I, when it comes to, to Jeff's writing, I'm a fanboy. I always have been, and I've read all of his stuff and I can't wait for the next, uh, Jeff Parker book to come out because mm -hmm. the writing is so perfect. You know, you're just so good at what you do and I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not blowing smoke. It's, it's real. And you know that I've mm -hmm. told you before. Um, but people may not know that, that only, I think only three people have ever won the Edgar for best novel more than once. And that's Dick Francis, James Lee Burke, and well, you. And so, I mean, that's great. I mean, there was this, oh my gosh, talk about, yeah, which was just oh, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there was maybe my favorite Jeff Parker book this <laughs> been wow. maybe because it's here in orange County, you know, where I live and, and, and just the characters and the sweep of history of this book and, and everything about it was just phenomenal. And, uh, I think those are the two you won the, uh, the Edgar for, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you want another Edgar for a short story and mm -hmm. I wish you'd give me one of them, but I understand. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, well, thanks for your kind words. I, I really yeah. appreciate that, and and I I, um, I I like both of those books. And, and mm -hmm. I think if I you know ever wrote you know books that that would deserve an Edgar, those those, those would be them. You know, yeah. and, and especially California Girl, I liked. I I was uh, you know, I was so tempted and and kind of intimidated at the idea of of of, of creating a book with big, long flashbacks of I mean, they go mm -hmm. way back, you know, 20, yeah. uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and, and that's what this book, even longer than that. And, and, and so, uh, I was, I was so scared to write that book. I had the idea I was going to be brothers and there's going to be a cop and a reporter and a, a, pre, a minister, evangelical minister and then mom and dad, and they're going to live in this, this, uh, this, this farm, this ranch in, in, in Tustin where they, they, you know, grow oranges and stuff, you know, before the suburbs all moved in. And, uh, and, and and it's going to go back and forth in time, and but it's and it's going to open now, and it's going to go way back into the into the early '60s, late '50s, when this family is is young and and in Tustin, and and uh, and, and and I kept thinking about it, and it's, but and it's I want to come forward with a with an incorrectly solved murder, a murder that remains incorrectly solved, uh, not unsolved, but incorrectly solved for 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 40 years, whatever it is, and and. And I and I thought, God, this is going to be hard. This book is going to be really hard. I'm used to just writing A to Z, and oh, it starts on Monday and it's done next Thursday, kind of thing. You know, it's just mm -hmm. logical. Mm -hmm. Like Lagoon Heat takes place over a week. You know, every day is, you know, it's, and and uh, so I out, I decided to outline it. My dad's an engineer. He was an aerospace engineer for most of his career. He was a terrific engineer and a great draftsman and everything. And he always forever had um, these pads of of of, of uh, quarter inch, you know pads for, for, for writing on, you know, sketching on, drawing on and stuff. And, uh, and, and so I got myself one of those and I outlined, I tried to outline this California girl book that I had in mind and, and I, I couldn't do it. I, it, I, it. I could not do it. I could not figure out how to, how to project in my imagination, no, a novel that's going to go forward in, you know, 50, 60 page bursts of, of now. And then, 50, 60 page bursts of, of 40 years ago. How are you gonna how are you gonna organize this ahead of time? Like, how do you possibly how you can't do that? Just give up. And so I did. I gave up and um I sat down and, and, and I thought, well, what's a good opening scene? Let's just write an opening scene that takes place in an in an orange grove way back when when these 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 brothers are introduced and they're the they'll they'll be the protagonist, you know. And uh, so I did that. I wrote a rumble in the orange a fight between the brothers and another set of brothers uh, based on stuff that happened to me when I was in Tustin at that age. And um, it, it was a wonderful uh, chapter. It, it, it was wonderful. It was just, it really worked, you know. Didn't give me any idea really what the story was about, but it was just a cool scene, you know. And uh, so then I wrote another one and another one, and I just cobbled that book together one one layer at a time. And I just went one chapter at a time, you know, kind of, you know, what, what, what scene do I need here? You know, what needs to happen here? Um, what needs to happen next? And, and as you guys know, you know, one of the beauties of, um, of, of putting together a, a, a novel is that, is that, you know, for every, for every word that you write, for every, 
for every word that you put down, every sentence, every whatever it is, chapter, there's a consequence. And suddenly the consequences start to offer themselves up to you. So that just a few pages in, <laughs> excuse me, um, the consequences start to build. You know, it's action and reaction. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that's kind of how a novel goes, you know. And, and as long as you're you're lucky enough or clear-headed enough to see see what the consequence is, um, you, you'll be okay. I, I've always found in my writing career that when I get stuck mid-book, happens all the time, um, what I'm failing to see and why I can't figure out what happens next, literally, I don't know what to write next, um, that always happens when I fail to see the consequences of what just happened. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. always, always overlooking something, you know, and it's it's mm -hmm. there. It's already down, damn it. I just, you know, can't find it all the time. So anyway, all uh, all the young writers out there, you know, wanting to write or get going writing, mm -hmm. you know, bear that in mind, you know, what look, look yeah. when, you, when you get stuck, look, look at that last page you wrote or, or mm -hmm. start at the beginning and read through it. And you'll see, you'll see that you're failing to see what you're failing to see, which is what's consequential, you know. Plotting is not just one damn thing after another. It's one damn thing because of another. And I think that's the, I think that's it. Yeah, that's, that's it right there. You know, for, for years, you, um, you, you famously said that you didn't want to write a series. I think you had a couple that were dovetailed back in your early career, but then, then lo and behold, here comes Charlie hood, which was a great series. LA starting with LA outlaw, which was a fabulous book. Everybody should read. But then you developed another character, Roland Ford, who I think is one of the great characters of all time. How did you come up with Roland and 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 his whole story, which is just amazing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, thank you. That's that's really really good to hear. Good to hear. I thought uh, I thought uh, yeah. Um, I'm glad to hear that you liked him that much. I, I think I think the, the the essential thing about Roland was. Was well, well. I knew that I wanted to. I, I believed that I wanted to write a private eye um, you know, series, um, and um, the, my publisher at the at the time, Putnam, um, thought that was a good idea. So um, um, I, I signed on, if you will, for a private eye series. So I knew a guy was going to be a private eye, and then you know after that, I simply set the book where I live here in Fallbrook in North San Diego County, because there's so much going on around, you know, it's an easy place to set the book. And um, um, I, I, I hatched the idea that that it might be neat to write about a PI who specializes in in the finding of missing persons, um, because he himself has lost an important person uh, missing. His, his wife has gone missing in the sense that she dies in an airplane accident. And... Um, so I thought I thought that would be a good premise for for to, to give this guy some inner inner sort of engine that, that that drives him to to find people because he wants to help those clients find the person that he's never going to find himself because she's gone. And um, I based that that idea on on the fact that I lost my first wife very young. She was very young and I was very young. She got cancer and um, she died quickly and um and and so I, I i thought that i could i could i could understand roland's emptiness if you will or the hole that he's trying to fill through this mm -hmm. and so um so that that that's that's what i did and and uh you know the one of the neat things about the pi books that, that i most the ones that i've read and, and i tried to do it with roland was uh just the simple idea of the I love the I love the, the idea of the PI in his office, you know, um, <laughs> waiting for something to happen, waiting for the phone to ring. And 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 the, the, I think it's the first the first Roland book starts off that way. He's you know, he's uh you know, he's he, he's he's thinking he's thinking in his office, he's doing something, but you know, nothing's really happening and and uh, and he's talking about the the Mr. PI books that he likes to ha that he likes reading, you know. And uh, he, he goes, yeah. And, and I love it when the I love it when the uh, uh, when the the femme fatale, the the beautiful troubled woman, you know, walks through the door. The know? Bridget O'Shaughnessy, and, yeah. And, and, and the door opens, and there she is, you know. Yeah. 
and, and uh, <laughs> it, so I always try to have fun with the genre a little bit then, you know, and and stay within the bounds and and all. So uh, anyway, glad, I'm glad you like that. I, I had fun yeah. writing those things. It's a uh, it's a lot harder to those those are first person books. Roland's telling you the story, mm -hmm. and there, there's no flashbacks or any point of view fanciness or nothing like that. It's all Roland telling you the story, and um, and so they're straight chronological stories, straight through and. Um, and he's the only person who gives you any information at all. There's no other characters or voices or anything like that. And um, and 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 there's no sneaky stuff where you know other characters are doing things that the reader reads about, but Roland doesn't know about. There's none of that split protagonist stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so 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 it's it, it it's uh, um, it's those are first person books, and they're they they go chronologically. And he's the only source of information that the reader has. And so, the, so that sounds easy, you know. One one narrator, first person, um, tells the whole story in his voice. You know, tells the whole story himself, and it sounds like the the the, the way that all books should be written. <laughs> and but it's not <laughs> not easy. It's not easy. That's very it's difficult. Not, it's it's it is. It's a lot harder to write a straight through first person narrative than it is to 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 kind of loosen up the form and go into different perspectives and different characters mm -hmm. different voices if you will even do, and, and you know time can be manipulated so easily by a novelist and, and anyway so my, my, the lesson that i learned and and would pass on to, to anybody is is uh um i i would encourage beginning writers to write that way to to write in the first oh. person and to mm -hmm. write one character tell the story just start with that because um it's really hard to do and if you can do that, you can then you can then loosen up and 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 and, and use the, the the many novelist tools that you, mm -hmm. that you can use. But if you can't get that down, then you're going to have trouble. I think. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. So, what are you working on now? Gosh, what am I working on now? I got a I got a new book uh, uh, coming out in um, in July, just a few months from now. <clears throat> And it's uh, it, it's all done. My work is done on it. It's called Desperation Reef, and it's about big wave surfers battling pirates along the California coast. Mm. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, that's going to be juicy. I've got to read that one. It is. It's juicy. It's really yeah. Juicy. It's good. Sounds fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and 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 so it's a it's it's a thriller, if you will. It's a lots of lots of crime going on. It's not a uh, it's not a mystery in the sense that there's a body or something happens that needs to be solved. It's, it's more mm -hmm. of an ongoing escalation of violence between the surfers and the pirates. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's a very cool book. Uh, um, Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. It, yeah. it is cool. And one of the things I like about, you guys might like this, uh, I was, I was, uh, uh, I had the story in mind and I was, and I was, you know, starting to cobble together a, uh, uh, an outline for my publisher. They always want an outline, you know? Right. <laughs> well, I don't blame them. Who wouldn't, you know? Uh, so I'm, you know, cobbling together the story and reading about the places that I that I know that I would like to see happen in the story. And I'm reading about this area, um, <clears throat> this the surfing spot off of San Diego called Cortez Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, not known to most most people, but it's it, it's one of the premier big wave spots in in the world. The waves are gigantic and oh, wow. rideable sometimes. Uh, it breaks a hundred miles offshore. <laughs> so the water's kind of deep, except that uh, yeah. except that it breaks on a reef that's actually really shallow. It's a mountain range that's just barely covered up with water. And uh, Cortez Bank is near San Clemente Island, and so I'm reading about San Clemente Island, and I'm reading about the areas and stuff. And I know there's going to be fishing in the book. One of the one of the surfers also fishes. He supplies <clears throat> uh, fish. Uh, to his mother's restaurant. The, the special of the day is his responsibility. And I learned in my reading here that um, uh, one of the premier uh, fishing places off of San Diego, uh, off of San Clemente Island and close to Cortez Bank is a place called Desperation Reef. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> wow, you can't think of a yeah. better of that. I don't care what the book's about. I mean, Desperation Reef, how can you, how can you turn that down? Right. And I look at the room, I, and my agents go, oh my God, well, how'd you think of that? And they go, well, it's a real place. It's right there. Everybody can read about it. You know, it's one of the premier tuna grounds 
when the tuna are in are in town. So all the fishermen know it. They all know about it. You know. Oh so wow! It's kind of fun. It's it's a blast to put in stuff that you like to do, and 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 of course, the, the book takes place in in California, and it's about big wave surfing. And, and <laughs> big wave surfing ha it has its it's you know there's kind of a king and queen of big wave surfing in the world, and 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 uh, um, Mavericks is whichever say the queen. It's a huge break just south of San Francisco. You guys, mm -hmm. know it. Um, you know, you're talking 40, 50, 60 foot waves, sometimes bigger, freezing oh, cold water, um, mm -hmm. really shallow reef, you know, razor sharp rocks, sharks all over the place. And yep. the only way to get to ride one of those waves, the big ones, the only way you can even catch one on a surfboard is to be either dropped down with a by a helicopter into the middle of the wave or pulled into the wave by uh, a driver on a jet ski and a rope. And the driver comes up the face of the wave and just heads out and you drop the rope and you're in the wave as a surfer. You're in a 70 foot wave headed down at 35 miles an hour, wondering how you're going to make the turn, you know? So mm -hmm. anyway, Mavericks is Mavericks. And I, 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 and I went there, my wife and I went there for a, for a trip while I was writing the book and stuff and going out there and seeing the whole scene and and, and and looking at the looking at the videos, there's millions of videos. You know, this is all modern age stuff. It was real. It was really it was really fun. It was great to uh, it was great it was a great experience to do that and write about Mavericks. And and uh, I, I spent a lot of time in that book. Well, there's one other book I want to talk about, and and I recommend everybody read this, and especially people that live in Orange County with your Laguna roots and uh your love for that place and talking about real places that actually exist and most people don't even know what you're talking about when you say it but there's this and this to me was a phenomenal book and with incredible characters and then knowing laguna beach as well as we do i mean everything resonated so uh, what 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 inspired you to write this particular story with this marvelous collection of characters well, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I'm a fan of this book. I like this book a lot. I love that cover, especially. Yep. I and do too. Yeah. You know, what launched this was really kind of simple. Um, Doug, the, uh, it was, <clears throat> you know, the early, the early COVID 2020 March, you know, when, when, when New York was getting hit so hard and lockdowns were starting and the body counts were rising everywhere. And and we were all we you know, not not going out in lockdown time you know we had to have a mask and everything you you remember that you guys remember that <laughs> yeah. and it was and it was time for me to come up with a new book <clears throat> and I didn't have any any ideas what I was going to do I knew I didn't want to write another role in Ford I was just I was done and I wanted to write something else and I'm just kind of trapped in this little world here because I can't go anywhere and. Um, and I started, I started thinking about pleasant things because the, works, the world seems so dark mm -hmm. and um, full, of, full of death and all. And, and uh, uh, I started, for some reason, remembering my first experiences in Laguna Beach. I would have been 16, 14. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 14. Riding a bicycle, delivering papers and that kind of thing. Pretty close. Yeah, like, pretty, exactly. Pretty close. Yeah. yeah, not quite, but pretty damn close. And, and I started thinking about my early experiences there and, um, you know, the, um, the psychedelic world, if you will, like the cover mm -hmm. sort of suggests, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. music, the music of 1968, say, mm -hmm. um, um, the, you know, the hippies, the war, Nixon, drugs. Wow. What a. What the Hare a, Krishnas. Hare yeah. Krishna. They were huge at that time. Yeah. The beautiful coast, the artists. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot going on there. And, and it was such a it was such a vivid, beautiful thing to a 14-year-old to experience that because you know, 14-year-olds are 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 you know very curious and their senses are heightened. Their senses are all sharp. You can see well, you can hear well, you you, you remember everything you see, you know. But you don't, what you don't have as a 14 year old is you don't have any perspective. You don't have any experience. So when I, mm -hmm. when I you know, went into Laguna Beach, when I, starting when I was 14 to go body surfing with my buddies, mom and dad would drive us down there, drop us off. Um, and, and I'm seeing all these people, these nutty people and, and smelling this funny air. And, and uh, <laughs> it was, it was, it, it was so, so wild to me. I was, I was just wide eyed with, with wonder, you know, <laughs> 
I lived in Tustin, which was just over the hill 20 minutes, but Tustin was this little suburb, you know, it was nothing like Laguna Beach, mm -hmm. so it was like an outer space for me. And, uh, and, and, and as I started to cobble together a story, I wanted to set it in 68. And, and uh, because the Summer of Love was famously was 1967 in, in San Francisco, and so there's some horrible accident or arrest or something that happened towards the end of 67, uh, in, 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 during which the, you know, the, the, the hippie leaders up there and all the hate Ashbury um, kind of decided and decreed that this, the Summer of Love was now over and we're getting out and we're going mm -hmm. to Laguna. And that's what they did. And they flowed into Laguna, the hippies, these guys from San Francisco in early 68. And uh, so anyway, I wanted to take advantage of that. And uh, I wanted to, to, to paint that summer, summer of love scene, scene kind of a different way, you know, a year later. And uh, it was just one of the, it was, it's funny, Doug and, and Kathleen, the, uh, um, I wrote that book. Um, I had no idea really what I was going to do, except I'm just going to write a book about a young uh, boy looking for his sister missing sister uh, during the uh, in the psychedelic underground of Laguna Beach 1968 that was my entire outline to the publisher and the publisher said oh yeah go for it you know and uh, so I went for it and I just made it up as I went along and I wrote that book faster than any book I've ever written by half and in oh, wow. I write it in half the time it was twice as long it was gigantic it was a 600 page plus manuscript that I wrote in usually it takes me uh, say nine months this one took me six a little less than six and, and and I had to I, I ended up having to like you know take 200 pages out of it. I'd never taken 200 pages out of a book before. But anyway, wow. this book just flowed. It just came. It's just um, uh, one of those things. And I, and I think it was the it was the the uh, the darkness of COVID that pushed me into the mm. subject matter. And I think it was also the the fact that. I, I, we literally couldn't take a vacation or go a fishing trip or, you know, you could barely go to the market, you know. Um, so I didn't have anything else to do but write all day. And that's what I did. I figured it was a, it was escape. It was escapist fiction for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it worked oh. exceptionally well. Yeah, everybody should read that. I, like I said, the characters are just so rich. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, the whole story, it, it, you know, and like, but, you know. Living here makes it even better. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It sure does. It's, it's really a treat to be able to write about stuff that you've done and stuff that you've seen. You know, that's mm -hmm. really, really neat. I love, I, I, I love about about all the, you know, all all of the books that I've written are steeped in wherever it was that I was living at the time. You know, sometimes Laguna, you know, Newport, Tustin, Fallbrook. Um, yeah, yeah, they're all love letters to those places and those those memories. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's so cool. It's fun to, it's fun to do. Well, Jeff, we're going to have to have you back when your book's uh, getting ready to launch. Okay. Uh, yeah. You're a fantastic okay. interview. T. Jefferson Parker. I mean, I'm a huge fan as well, and it's been just a fantastic interview. So please do come back. And I'm going to ask all of our viewers to please click that thumbs up because it helps with the algorithm and gets the interviews out. And mm -hmm. please subscribe so we can bring a lot more interviews to you with other great authors like Jeff Parker. And um, again, thank you. And I hope we get to see you soon. Thank you very much. It's really nice talking to you guys. Thanks so much. It's just too, uh, too far between, you know, Yes. Yeah, and we don't live that far apart. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff, until next time. Thanks. All right, Doug. All right, Kathleen. Bye.